Meadow Halfhorn experienced a weird twinge in his brain just after breakfast. It was the type of twinge that demanded immediate attention, but much like the check drive light in his car, he chose to ignore it. Never mind that his car shortly thereafter became an X car. He had things to do and no time to worry about twinges. He scribbled a note for Luca and Terry, who would arrive while he was out. After sticking it to the fridge where one of them would hopefully see it, he hurried out the front door of his treehouse. As usual, he was running late. By choice, he'd insist to anyone who asked. After all, who in their right mind would arrive early to anything? Pure coincidence led him through his garden instead of down the path. Meadow reasoned that by cutting through the overgrown and disorganized chaos, he could save a few seconds, at most, and reach the festival plaza in reasonable time. His hooves sank into the dirt while burrs caught in his tail. As he whirled around to give a clinging vine a hearty piece of his mind, he noticed something peculiar. Well, more peculiar than usual. Meadow's garden was chock full of all sorts of weird and wonderful disasters, all homegrown with his special brand of flora magic. In fact, Meadow grew the very tree in which he lived, as well as many of the other halcyon oak apartments in the forest. Yes, he was a fawn of many talents, and all his plants thrived under his care. So he found it particularly odd that something on his very property had died. Moreover, a few sparks leapt around the plant like it was frog catnip. Sparks were the heralds of the water god Warrior, and no one wanted them around. They were noisy, obscenely bright yellow, left slime everywhere, and made general pests of themselves without even trying. Most logical beings considered them a nuisance, but they were the water god's chosen creatures, which meant, in some regard, they were sacred. That didn't stop people from punting them, though, especially when they set up camp around your home, or, gods forbid, inside your home. Shoo, Meadow ordered, waving a hand at them, or I'll get the spray, then you'll be sorry. They scattered, leaping out of his garden. Their webbed feet smack pattered against the force field shielded dirt road, then they disappeared into the forest's dense underbrush on the other side. That's better, he muttered, shaking his tail free from the burrs. Crouching down next to the dead weed, he narrowed his eyes. The leaves were black and strangely matte, as if they consumed all light and reflected none of it. Through his connection to the goddess Petalvine, Meadow sensed that the leaves weren't dead, but altered. Caught within another plane of life. Horrifying. Far be it from him to describe something with excessive hyperbole, although he described things with excessive hyperbole excessively and often. But all he sensed from the diseased foliage was darkness. Cliché, but apt. He tilted his head and scratched at the base of one of his horns as he pondered. Then he did what any self-respecting fawn would do. He reached out and poked at the thing. It wobbled as a normal leaf should. Unlike a normal leaf, however, it made Meadow want to tear off all his skin and roll in the dirt to escape its sheer wrongness. Just in case he somehow misinterpreted the first poke, he did it again. This time he was overtaken with a desire to ask a Dracotherix to chew his hands off. This was the opposite of a plant. No, not an animal or dirt or anything else with a viable definition. This was a not plant. Weird, he understated, trying to banish the shiver worming its way up his spine. He didn't remember growing that. True, occasionally his experiments would breed and produce something even more horrendous than before. But such were the hazards of flora magic. At least none of his plants had ever eaten anyone. Yet? In any case, he could unmagic the thing when he got home. As Meadow rose, a car glided around a corner onto a street, and the glow from its gist care drive briefly sparkled off something metal half buried in the ground. Interesting. He could have ignored it. But what sort of fawn would he be if he did? Then someone else would find it. Then he wouldn't have the satisfaction of a mystery well solved. That wouldn't do. All sorts of surprises today, he muttered, kicking at the dirt hiding the shiny thing. Crouching again and being careful to avoid touching the knot plant, he brushed the soil away until he unearthed a copper chain pouch. It was the kind sometimes carried by acolytes of the goddess Zero and roughly the size of an apple. Hoping to find an apple inside, Meadow untied the cord and peered within, only to find a handful of stones instead. Drat, inedible. Still, his curiosity got the best of him and he upended the copper bag onto his palm. 
a trio of stones rolled from it. Pretty, but unremarkable, they were rough and uncut, and certainly not the type Zero's followers usually used as lay stones. In fact, they were so fresh from the mine that dried mud still dappled their surfaces, so much so that Meadow could barely see the colors of them. Scratching the mud away, he uncovered an emerald, a deep red garnet, and a lump of onyx. For most fawns, finding such a treasure would mean finder's keepers, and given Meadow's natural affinity to onyx, he wore quite a bit of onyx jewelry, he was tempted to keep it. But the stone seemed valuable, and he did have an inkling of a conscience, so he checked the bag for evidence of an owner. After all, he liked the followers of the Earth Goddess. They were kind, pleasant to talk to, and their godmark made them smell like the forest after a refreshing rain. He'd never steal from them. After tilting the bag toward the light, he found a scrap of parchment stuck within the links of the copper chain. Fishing it out with his hoof-horn nails, he unfolded it, the scent of rain still fresh upon it. It was recently written. Meadow, he read aloud, take these with you. Well then, he wasn't about to refuse free rocks. Satisfied with his find, he rolled them back into the bag. That's when he noticed the dirt shifting beneath him. Alas, he'd stood in one spot for so long that tiny pink flowers now bloomed from the ground surrounding his hooves. His own godmark was much flashier than the godmark of Zero's chosen, and its appearance meant he'd wasted too much time on studying the strange offerings in his garden. Now he was running even later. Stowing the copper bag in one of his pouches, he hopped over the garden's short retaining wall and set off at a decent clip toward the festival plaza. Benji would, of course, excuse his tardiness, because Benji was the most laid-back person Meadow ever met. Even so, there were limits to his rudeness, and he refused to cross that self-imposed line. Out of breath and sweating, he slid through the plaza's gates and wound his way through the garden to the competition grounds. With any luck, he'd make it in time for his friend's victory. With even greater luck, he would have missed all the boring stuff that came before the victory like the posturing, the deafening silences, and the God's forsaken thinking.